totally believe in what we're doing and I think it's the most important thing that I can be doing right now. There are so many people who are sick and if this can help them, people have to know about this. It's fantastic that I get to share this with my family, that we're doing this together and that we both feel so passionately about it. She was on over 40 different medicines. She had been on methotrexate um, and Plaquenil, one of those which nearly destroyed her vision. All the potent anti-inflammatories, the Vioxx and the Celebrex, and was on all sorts of painkillers and all sorts of antibiotics. She had classic steroid toxicity. Her face was the shape of a moon because there's a lot of, of swelling that occurs in the face. At the age of 16, was diagnosed with uh, juvenile rheumatoid arthritis, and that evolved into a lupus condition, a diagnosis of interstitial cystitis, an autoimmune disorder. Bedridden four years, her mother thought she would never survive. I went to talk to William as a friend and as a doctor about his experience with patients and how they used cannabis. Seeing what the juicing did for me, using it in this form was so significant, it changed my life. About four to six weeks after I started on juicing every day, I had no more back pain, I didn't need pain pills, I felt the best I ever had. A lot of people think cannabis and pot are you know, not medicine. I had stumbled on an article in Scientific America in uh, December 2004. They had an article on marijuana as the brain's own marijuana, and they introduced the idea that the body produces uh, compounds that are very similar to those found in marijuana or cannabis. Cannabis actually goes upstream and provides feedback from the postsynaptic nerve to the presynaptic nerve, which was unheard of in neurochemistry. I mean, all neurotransmissions were unidirectional, and all of a sudden, swimming against the force of that are these little cannabinoid molecules that tie the whole system together, the phytocannabinoids from this plant augment the body's attempt to restore and increase function to a normal level. So it mimics the regulatory system of cellular physiology. And recently the Food and Drug Administration has approved of CBD, which is a cannabinoid like THC. One of 80 cannabinoids. The federal patent compares vitamin C, vitamin E, and CBD or cannabidiol. CBD turns out to be more potent than either of those two. The thing that I warn my patients of is if you're going to be juicing this flower and this leaf and you're going to be doing this high dose non psychoactive cannabinoid dietary approach, please do not heat it. When you heat cannabis, you make it psychoactive, which for a large part of the community, um, the psychoactivity of a plant is a measure of its medical quality. Um, but it's really quite the inverse. If you heat or age cannabis in any way, you're destroying some of the medicinal properties of it. To use the plant effectively, we have to use it the way it evolved over 34 million years, which is raw, because when it's raw, the THC is bound up as THC acid. It requires aging, drying, so as a hunter-gatherer, we gather this plant and we notice, wow, as this plant ages, it changes character and suddenly has a psychoactive effect. I think that's the most exciting area of cannabis research is looking at non-psychoactive cannabinoids. Because if you do heat it, you'll decarboxylate the THC acid, and you're gonna have 600 milligrams of THC acid with the CBD acid. You'd be unconscious probably for the better part of the week. Between um, heating the plant, whether that's in a sucker, a cookie, a baked good, um, a butter, vaporized, smoked, all of those uh, techniques um, convert THC acid, which is non-psychoactive, into THC, and provide you with that 10 milligram dose. Um, but if you eat the plant raw, um, then THC acid is the way it's found in the plant. It's not psychoactive. The juicing allows you to get up to the 500 to 600 milligrams, which is 60 times more than you could tolerate if it was heated. This treatment is not psychoactive. People don't have to be stoned when they take it. They can take it and go to work. They can take it and play with their kids. It's hard for me to to understand laws against something like green leaf therapy and to think that prednisone is legal. We're still fighting the, the stigma of uh, marijuana back from the 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s. 
I was a prosecutor for eight years in Mendocino County, so I know it from both as a defense attorney and as a prosecutor. The 1972 Controlled Substances Act said that marijuana has no medical value whatsoever. The federal government has a patent on its medical properties. The Food and Drug Administration has approved of it as investigative the drug. I have not found the United States to be very open about cannabis research. In order to print an article in a peer-reviewed journal, you have to use cannabis that they have certified for your study. And there are physicians who have waited three, four, five, six years, some even longer than that, to just get a sample. The federal government's been kind of schizophrenic in the way it looks at marijuana. It says it has no medical value under that act, but at the same time, the federal government has been funding research in marijuana for years, for decades and they've even patented certain strains of marijuana because they recognize it has its, that medical value. The California Narcotic Officers Association does not believe in medical marijuana. They believe it's all a big scam, and that's how they train law enforcement officers. Law enforcement is allowed to take a percentage of all assets that are forfeited and seized under the state and federal asset forfeiture law. So it takes the really enlightened and compassionate law enforcement officer to recognize that these medical marijuana laws are designed to protect patients. I was trained when someone had marijuana, you took them to jail. There wasn't a medicine use for, for marijuana. It's an illegal substance, and people went to jail for it. In 1996, California took a huge leap. Uh, I didn't support Proposition 215 because of the uh, education I had, the experience I had, and what I had seen through the illegal marijuana gardens that I had seen throughout my career. Since 1996, I have changed my opinion somewhat. I believe there is a very clear medicinal use for marijuana. That being said, I believe that there are a, a large percentage of people who use marijuana as an excuse to either make profits or for recreational. The, uh, the, the people who use marijuana for the true intended use that the voters pass, medicinal, I'll do everything I can to support their rights. There's many more things that law enforcement can be focused on than medicinal marijuana. And I, I don't want to give the impression at all that I support people who are growing marijuana for medical purposes 364 days of the year, and then one day a year they make a big sale for a couple hundred thousand dollars, and, and they're a, a, a commercial seller that one day of the year. They're the people who are causing problems for the people who really and truly need and can use medical marijuana. Terrifying, you know, to be told as a parent that your child does have a tumor in, in her brain. It took 24 hours in the operating room. They gave us a 10% chance of survival with treatment. At the Oakland Children's Hospital, where they called me and they said they had a baby who they were discharging home. They had, this baby had completed all treatment that would be useful for it, had a brain tumor, excuse me, um, had, uh, had surgery, had radiation and chemo, and the tumors were still growing and still multiplying. Um, and therefore they, they said to the parents, just take this baby home and make it comfortable. Uh, because there's nothing more that we know that will help its condition. Started to accept the to the point where the illness had taken her and us and try and find some acceptance. A month went by and I got in contact with the family and they said, well, we just came back from Children's Hospital. They did a CAT scan. The tumors have shrunk and there are fewer of them. And they said, I'll tell you, what we've been doing, we've been juicing the fan leaves of the marijuana plant and giving this our baby a shot glass of this juice every day. But this is like this wonderful hospice story. She is no longer on hospice. Um, I brought the oxygen concentrator back. Um, it's, it's just one of those wonderful success stories. This, you know, the plant is a pretty amazing plant because it appears that the juice of this plant is, is saving this baby's life. Here we have something that can really change people's lives. I mean, I was laying in bed, catheterized, thinking that physicians were just trying to make me comfortable. They really didn't think that there was anything more that they could do and that I may not live to be 30, which I am now, that that was the best I could hope for. 
the best I could hope for was taking enough Macedone and Percocet every day that I just didn't feel anything at all. I had been gotten in touch with Dr. Courtney because we had received a doctor's recommendation from one of his patients and in it it asked that they start juicing the leaves and having capsules and a few other items which I didn't know anything about. So after I contacted him, I was really excited to hear that there might be some other alternatives to um, the smoking of the cannabis. These are friends we've had in the past year. They said, uh, your father's not the same as he was when we first met him. He seems to be much more alive and much, you know, doing a lot more and more active. And I had informed them that it was because of the juice that he had been taking. Right after we started juicing that he seemed to be more active. You know, we would do things out in the garage more and he wouldn't spend so much time in his chair. Uh, we have ran, ran out uh, periodically in the last year and a half and uh, that's what made me convinced that he needed it because when he would run out, he would have trouble getting out of the car. I had four doctors tell me that I should have a hysterectomy. You either have no ovaries or at the very least you're sterile. That my endometriosis was so bad I would never be able to have a child. Despite a very potent birth control, despite being sterile, Zahaya decided she was going to come join the party. Yeah. We like to distinguish ourselves by being extremely scientific. And people know that if they're going to come to us, they're going to have to go through a lot of hoops, but they're also going to get the most up-to-date scientific knowledge on this subject. And they're going to see a physician who's an expert in the field of non-psychoactive cannabinoids. And there are plenty of people that want that and are looking for that. We opened um, our fifth office in Luxembourg. Their government is really sympathetic and open. There's an international group studying autism and CBD in, in Luxembourg. There's a physician there who's writing cannabis scripts who's also a senator. And we've been working with him, Senator Columbera. The government may be actually funding experiments in a research center using cannabis in large part because of Dr. Courtney's work with non-psychoactive cannabinoids and Senator Columbera's work with cancer patients. There are now facilities for testing uh, plants, and there's been more progress made in the last five to six months. A new strain in from Spain called Canatonic, 6.9% CBD. Uh, that's a 700% increase over Northern Lights, which is our previous high producer. I would like to find strains that have all of the cannabinoids present in an amount that's useful. I'd like to produce strains that are adapted to environment. In Luxembourg, we're producing thousands and thousands and pounds of seed, you know, to raise the money to give away, you know, a half a pound of seed. Because if that person grows an acre of cannabis and feeds their family the proteins they set and the fatty acids, I mean, an incredible food source, an incredible preventative medicine source, and an incredible therapeutic source. And at the same time, they're sucking five times as much CO2 out of the environment um, as, as an acre of trees. First, we have to change convention treaty number one, which was the convention that the UN put out in 1961 that says cannabis is a crime should be, if you have it, if you grow it, if it's in your possession, you should be in prison. That dogma has dominated the world uh, right now. Um, they're look, asking for input from the World Health Organization and in the process of writing a letter stating that you know, this is a dietary essential, it's not a criminal thing, because we have to change that treaty before we can go into Central and South America and say, you know, here's, you grow yourself an acre of this plant, feed your family, prevent illnesses. So Cannabis International kind of legalizing the plant globally, giving it back to people as a food source, prevent illness is so much better than waiting until you have diseases. With my own experience and all the patients that I've spoken to, I believe that it's not an isolated incident, that this is the best medication 